Code for Lib Wiki, and there is a section for regional Code for Lib um, groups. And you want to see if there's an active one near your area. If there's not an active one during, within your area, um, just Code for Lib it and just get it started. Now, the second thing I want to point out for people who, again, might not be um, familiar with Code for Lib and also this is their first Code for Lib, um, today is going to be a very packed schedule. There are a lot of talks, and yesterday you're, you might be already full from yesterday. Your brain might be already full yesterday. Um, I just want to remind folks that if you need a mental break, it is totally okay if you go out to the lobby area and just decompress for like a talk or two and then come back. Um, again, a lot of this stuff is really awesome, but it's a lot. So uh, to avoid or to lessen the conference fatigue, um, go ahead and take that break if you need it. And I ran out of helpful housekeeping stuff. There's also one spot for lightning talk left for this morning. Uh, go ahead and sign up for that. And I think there's slots still left for Thursday. So go ahead and sign up for those during break. For those of you who are going to be doing lightning talks this morning, when we have our break, go ahead and come up here and load your slides because we like stuff being prepared beforehand, which is awesome. Um, what? Another song. Uh, it depends on the AV person. I'll yell. I, I, okay. I also switched it, but I'll yell. Um, we also have, um, as in previous years, book giveaways. Okay. We, we, do not have as many as we had previously, but during the first one, I'll read off the titles we have, and if your name gets called, you get your pick, but you have to be in the room when your name is called, or you miss your chance. So, since we have that stipulation, when will be the first book raffle? Traditionally, the book raffles are done as an incentive for people to get back into the room after breaks and lunches. <laughs> So they generally are the first thing before sessions. We only have 10 books to give away this year. Um, so uh, I don't know how we want to pace those. I'm not going to micromanage that decision. But I will leave it up to the MCs as to when to call for giveaways. Mm. I have a question. Question. Uh, Social activities tonight. Well, we do have a couple for y'all to come out and uh, hang out with other cultural livers. The first one is the AV Geeks um, library related uh, shorts and films. So the AV Geeks is um, what they do is they take the really old educational films, you know, the ones that they showed in the 50s, 60s, the really bad ones. If you're familiar with my, if, uh, with Mystery Science Theater 3000, <laughs> that. So they are holding that event tonight, more information on the social activities page. Or if um, MST3K really bad educational films um, is not your cup of tea, we do also have a gaming night that is being held not, I don't know if it's in this room, but it's in one of the uh, conference rooms. Um, more information is on the social activities wiki. Uh, we do have a variety of games. It starts at 6, going to at least 10. So if you're a gamer, go ahead, join us. If you like doing uh, MST 3 and King, um, really bad educational films, you can go there as well. Or if you just want to start your own event, uh, please use the wiki if you want to get some other folks to join you. Any other questions that people might have? We have about five minutes. Since we're not doing an ask anything session, um, let's do three minutes of that. Countries. Hmm? Countries of attendees. Countries of attendees, all right. So as you probably have figured out, Coferlib does draw you know, people from all over the world. So let's 
do something. North America, raise your hands. Uh huh. Those of us in Europe, raise your hands. All righty, we got a few. Awesome. Um, and. They can't see the end. So we had about three to four people. Um, every year, Code for Lib Japan sends a contingency over to the main Code for Lib conference. Uh, are they here in the room right now? Awesome. We have two people from Code for Lib Japan. <laughs> and then we have, uh, well, who else did I miss? I guess I should say that much. Egypt. Egypt. So we have Egypt. Yeah. <laughs> Which the, the rest of Asia, because <laughs> the rest of Asia. <laughs> so just to give you a little bit of context, the. Egypt contingency was tied for first with the Code for Lib presentation voting, and Indonesia was one of our uh, diversity scholarships. Uh, Africa, and the rest of Africa. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're basically the African <laughs> So do we have anyone from South, Amer South America? You know, I'm going to. We need to work on that. Um, I, I'm going to throw out this challenge to the interwebs. Um, we need a South American contingency here. So I'm throwing that challenge out there. Um, Antarctica. <laughs> Australia. Australia. None this year, but I have met folks from Australia previous years. So again, I'm throwing that out there as a challenge for any Australian folks out there. Um, since it's at Portland next year, we might see more Australians. Hopefully, airfare is not too bad. Um, that's North America. <laughs> All right, where are the Canadians? Yeah, yeah. We have about six Canadians. <laughs> what else can we do for the next three minutes before I embarrass, what? Sing? Pirate joke. No, no, Cynthia Ning does the pirate jokes. Ing. Ing. Okay. In, in the wiki, you know what I put down for my MC description. I am the destroyer of last names. Yeah. So, Artie Chan, are you really surprised that I butchered your last name? Okay, good. Okay, last announcement. I see there are people standing on the wall. Um, we highly encourage y'all to take some chairs. Um, Raise your hand if you have an empty chair next to you. Unless you really do not need a chair or you need to be in and out, please sit down. There is power at these tables. Actually, I like to um, give a hand to the planning committee of making sure that there are power strips at every table. All right, so we're gonna have some holdouts on the side, which is okay. All right, so it is one minute. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. Our first talk, as you probably have noticed, Tuesday's first talk was uh, the uh, first of two that were tied in uh, the Code for Lib presentation voting. So this year we had um, voting of the first top 10 and then the programming committee chose the rest of the program. 
And the two presentations that got tied for first, the first one was about the book fair from Biblioteca Alexandria. The second one, I am very proud to say, comes from Grinnell College. And for those of you who do not know what Grinnell College or, you know, you might be asking yourself, where the hell is Grinnell? Um, my response would be, who the hell cares? We actually sell that in our bookshop. <laughs> it's on a t-shirt. <laughs> and we have a couple of Grinnellians here. So the first talk is visualizing solar search results with D3JS for user-friendly navigation of large result sets by Julia Bowder, dis, um, data services librarian at Grinnell College.
culture. If you go to our library catalog and do a keyword search for women in popular culture, it defaults to the list search you're familiar with, but it also gives you a link then to click over and view the visualization of the search results. So what can you tell by looking at this? You can tell that in addition to the field of sociology, the field of languages and literature also has a major interest in this topic. There's actually more items in the language and literature area than in the social sciences area on it, in fact. Um, you might notice that the specific topic facet, women in popular culture, shows up in both the language and literature section and the social sciences section. And you might click through and look at the specific books in each area and get a sense of how um, literature people versus social scientists approach that topic differently. And again, you can click through and see the specific books. So our hypothetical student might notice that the, the topic facets about women in films or women in literature show up in the language and literature section, not the social sciences section. And that might be a clue to her that those are more appropriate topics for a literature class rather than a sociology class. So the topic facets, I have it set up so they only show up in blocks of a specific size because otherwise it's just, it's too crowded, it's too hard to read. But if you're interested in one of the, the smaller areas like um, US history, you can click on that and zoom in and then see all the topic facets in that area. And again, the student might take a look at this um, and notice that there's only a few books related to African-American women in popular culture versus women in popular culture generally. That might be a clue to where that, that might be a, a manageable topic. There's a smaller number of things on it. And again, you can click through and view the specific books. So if you're playing along on our live server, by the way, I just would like to point out that I um, created this video off of our test server, which doesn't have as much data as our live server, so we'll be getting slightly different results if you're looking at this um, in our live catalog. So for right now, this particular visualization um, with the, the first letter of the call number is the top level, and the topic facets, the subsections of the Library of Congress subject headings is the second level. This is the only visualization right now. Um, it was just easier when I was developing this. We don't have a lot of developers at our institution, so this is, I mean, really kind of a solo project. Um, it was just easier to have this, um, some things hard-coded to have fewer moving pieces for the first round of development. Um, definitely, though, I would like to go back and make it a configurable option to visualize different, different index fields, maybe even make that a user option that they can choose. Um, and maybe even have it as an option to visualize results with different visualizations like the, the sunburst or something. Um, but that definitely wasn't something I wanted to tackle in the first round of development. So next steps. Get it, steps. Um, that's one of them is to make, um, to make some options configurable. Another one is to share the code. Um, I'm still working out a couple of little kinks, but I'm hoping to have this up on the Grinnell College Library's GitHub pretty soon, and I've been talking to the folks at Villanova who were in charge of Viewfind, and we might um, be putting this into the core of Viewfind code at some point soon, too. So hopefully if you're running Viewfind, there'll be ways for you to get this pretty soon. And then obviously as a new type of interface, this is just crying out for usability testing. And Becky and I have an intern lined up this summer who wants to do usability testing on a bunch of our systems, including this one. Um, so I'm hoping to have some, some publishable data out of that and be able to publish some usability results for this sometime, probably next year. Because so far, the only students who have seen this are ones who work for the library. Um, we staff our reference desk with well-trained undergraduates who we call research tutors, and they were some of the first people I showed this to. And they looked at it a lot like the reference and instruction librarians did when I showed it to them. They were viewing it as a teaching tool. Is something they could use to teach students about disciplinarity and interdisciplinarity, you know, figuring out which disciplines are interested in a, a particular topic, or as ways to teach um, what the Library of Congress call numbers actually mean, what you can tell from them. So they were looking at it that way as a teaching tool. Um, so I'm curious what naive students who don't have a librarian or a reference tutor or somebody who really knows libraries
sorry. For those of you who have uh, seats available, can you raise your hands? Thank you. All right, great. Um, I am Matt Miller. Um, I am a developer at NYPL Labs at the New York Public Library. Um, we're kind of a group of developers that work on various projects, um, including special collections and crowdsourcing, things like maps, um, but also library systems like um, our archives platform, and now we're moving into ebooks. So there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, I'm going to talk today keeping in the vein of visualizing these search results and visualizing our resources um, as opposed to just lists. And I'm going to be kind of demoing uh, some early findings and some early prototypes of what you can do um, using networks to look at um, our library resources. And I should warn you, this is kind of like a very early ex like experiment or kind of investigation into this kind of possibility of developing new interfaces or thinking about how you would do this sort of thing. So it's not too developed yet. So this is when we talk about why networks, you know, why is the talk, why isn't the talk called how do we visualize library resources as pie charts or something like that, you know. Um, network seems very uh, kind of inherently geared towards this kind of material. Um, then we're going to look at some networks in, in the archives world and some networks in um, the catalog. and how you can go about building something like that. So why networks? Um, if you think about the kind of resources that we have in our collections and in our catalog, they're kind of disparate kind of documents and group of documents. And you don't really think about um, how we interact with them or how we query them. It's usually kind of very search-based. You know, How can I get the specific title? How can I get the specific author? It's not really geared towards you know, how do I get a group of resources that are similar together, or how do we get a group of resources that could be related in some way? And this is not really a new question, and you kind of have to forgive me for putting a Foucault quote so early in the morning, but this is not, I put, I put up here not to be obnoxious, but to say like this is not a, um, a, a new question. People have been thinking about this for a long time, and in this quote he's basically saying, you know, how do we, how, how can a document be united together? How can documents tell uh, a, a unified discourse or a unified series of relations. And so this is a kind of a really, really interesting question for me, especially in kind of this context of, you know, library technologists. How do we, how would you go about making something that does this? How would you, how, what would that look like if you could make an interface that um, queries a unified discourse rather than records? Um, so I think it's going to be, a, it's a really important kind of field to think about in direction towards how we build systems in the future and, you know, what we really want our systems to be doing. I mean, if you think about, you know, the current situation or past situations, this kind of knowledge, this domain knowledge was held in the, you know, libraries and archivists. And that's always going to be the best way to access this knowledge. But when you have, you know, hundreds of thousands of subjects or millions and millions of records, you know, you can't have a domain specialist for every possible scenario. So the idea is, you know, what would this look like if we could start querying things um, in, in groups rather than individuals? And so, so networks are really geared towards this sort of work. Um, and a few reasons why they are is because they scale really well. Um, you could have a few hundred things in a network. And when I'm talking about networks, I'm meaning, uh, you know, individual nodes in a kind of graph connected by uh, links or edges. And so you could have a few hundred of these nodes or you could have you know, hundreds of thousands or even millions. And they really kind of scale up towards being able to see larger patterns and then also being able to, you know, zoom in and drill down to individual uh, nodes. And so this ability to see larger patterns is really important because you can start doing things like visualizing your collection strengths or finding out um, outliers. You know, any kind of data, data visualization is great for finding outliers. Um, so. Networks really kind of fit in this, in this world for that reason. And another reason is for is this term serendipity. And we heard people talk about this yesterday a little bit. And it's becoming kind of like a buzzword for the past maybe year or so. Um, 
So what does it mean, like finding something that you didn't know you wanted? So it's kind of, I mean, almost cliche in a way, but it is kind of a, a really important way in this digital world of how we discover resources and how we, um, you know, discover things when you can't have something physical. And it's serving as like an alternative way of browsing. So I wanted to show, I'm gonna start kind of small with some small demos and then work up to my larger demo. Um, I'm gonna show a demo of what it would look like if you looked at a collection as a network. So a single archival collection. And I have to give a shout out to Trevor Thorne who um, was the architect of the system. He's, he was formerly at NYPL now at NC State Libraries. So of course you can't do these kind of visualizations unless you have good data and that's kind of like the foundation of, of all this. So this is um, a, co a collection, archival collection of uh, papers by Samuel Tilden. He's a, a, f a prominent New Yorker in the later half of the 19th century. And it's a fairly large collection. You can see there's many components and series, and et cetera. So if you wanted to think, look, at, look at this collection as a whole really quickly, um, you can start doing that by looking for similarities between component titles and series titles and start pulling together um, connections. So for here, so you see we have like New York here and you know, other sort of series collections in these little, little files or documents or components and the, the clouds or con concepts. And so this is, again, a D3 visualization. Um, the, it's being fed a JSON feed and it's using the D3 um, force network simulation to render this, this kind of graph. And so, you know, it's kind of, it's almost like a little toy kind of, but it's, you kind of see everything at a distance at once. And you say, well, like, okay, well, I know this, this is, you know, he's heavily involved in New York and there's other sorts of categories that I might be interested in. So it's like a good entry into thinking about what a network could do and how you could use it as a, a tool for visualizing collections. I wanted to take this one step further and say, well, how could we use networks to look at more than one collection? How could we look at networks, say, for all of our collections? And of course, one way to do, do this is through subject or access terms. So like in the catalog world, archives are often assigned access terms, and you can use these to kind of generate these conglomerates of, of related things in the, in the entire span of the archives. Um, so say if I'm interested in Jack Kerouac and we have his papers. So I want to look at what he has in the network. And so all of a sudden you get a kind of a larger view of what is available connected to Jack Kerouac. So of course his papers are, are available and these are the people that mentioned in those papers. But also, you know, he's mentioned in the Burroughs papers and also He's mentioned in this Montgomery Cliff papers, and inside that is a, a screenplay for On the Road. And so all of a sudden you've seen, you've seen these secondary and tertiary connections that you wouldn't necessarily find in just a search result or a facet. So you get to see the, a larger picture, and you can kind of begin to play around with that notion of combining things together to, to create a pattern. And for example, you could add, add other things besides people. people so if you're interested in other kind of poets, maybe you're interested in African American poets and uh, Kerouac. And so this kind of thing will generate a new pattern and you can start to see collections that share those two things in common. And let's see if I can zoom out. I'm not used to this thing pad. Zoom out, oh, there we go. Okay, um, so you can start to see connections. So there's this individual is in both African American poets and mentioned in the Kerouac papers. So you know there's a serendipitous discovery between these these collections. And again, that's a D, this is a D3 uh, force graph simulation, and it's it does have its limitations though because it is done, doing this all in the browser, so it has to do this these calculations for the relationships of the nodes and also move 100 SVGs around the screen crazily at once. 
So it's, it is, does have its limitations about how many things you can display at once. Um, so that's pretty much the, the work I've been doing in archives. Um, the limits on this. So as you know, it's really time, uh, time, it takes a lot of time to add access terms to collections. Um, archivists do great work, but they don't have infinite resources to spend all day assigning terms to component level access. Um, so we need more data to make this more functional or more interesting. Um, and some of those ways to get that data could be things like natural language processing, the EAD files for more control terms. This is simply said, but very hard to do in practice. Um, but there are some other group, groups out there that are working on this. Um, leveraging existing terms. So if you have Kerouac, you know his LC URI, you, you hit VF, you get the DBpedia terms, and you bring those in. And all of a sudden you have an you know, uh, expanded set of search terms that don't necessarily describe the archive, but they can be used for discovery. Um, institutional data. I think this is really, really interesting. What if we could start adding our own institutional data, like who donated this collection? You know, what other collections did they donate? What was the donor's relationship to the board of trustees or something like that? So you begin building this kind of inter, uh, institutional information that could be very kind of informative. Um, and also start using the crowd to build these connections. So um, if uh, in a certain session, the same two uh, collections are visited over and over again, you can infer a link and start building up these links and that might be kind of an interesting way to add additional data to the system. So I'm gonna talk, now switch over to the catalog which is a hugely larger problem. Um, and when you think about catalogs, you need to think about how you would connect records together. And as we saw yesterday, people do this with subject headings. And I, I'm again working with subject headings. Um, so what I'm presenting here is not a network of books or individual things, but a network of subject headings. And so here's kind of the rules for the game for this visualization. Um, each subject is a node in the graph. Um, this is including subdivisions and sub-subject sub headings. Um, so every time there's a sub subject uh, subdivision, it's broken apart and all those things are linked together. Um, we only add a subject if it's used more than once. There's a ton of single-use subject headings in the catalog that we don't, aren't very interesting. Um, the size of the node or the subject is determined on the number of times it appears. Um, when two subjects occur in the same record, that means a connection is between those two subjects. And I'll give an example of this. Um, and the more, co more core, core occurrences, the stronger the connection. So here's an example, um, team of rivals, here's the subject headings for this book. Um, what we wanna do is for each one of these subjects, headings, break it up and say, okay, political leadership is related to the United States and history is related to political leadership, et cetera, et cetera. And you wanna do that for each subdivision and then also across subdivisions for every header. So you build up a, a large amount of data. So I did this for all of our mark records, um, so it was eight and a half million mark records, ended up being around 430, 100,000 subjects, in, unique subjects, and about 11 million connections. So 11 million connections between all these um, different subject headings. And it's, I think I'm just gonna show you it first and then explain how, to, to how we would make something like that. So this is what it looks like. Um, so this is a huge, huge kind of problem to simulate. And, and what network analysis and network simulation is, is basically um, a physics simulation. So, you, so everything has strengths between them, uh, everything has a repulsion value, there's a, there's a universal gravity value, and you just kind of throw all the stuff into the simulation and you say, do your thing, and render and self-organize yourselves, and we'll look at you when you're done. Um, so that's what this is. This is a self-organized map of New York Public Library subject headings. And let's do a live demo. Nope, not yet. Okay, so if the, the, the link was, if, you, if your Wi-Fi is working, mine was kind of spotty earlier, um, but it's bit, bit.ly slash NYPL network if you want to follow along. So this is, this is what I mean by go, being able to see patterns. 
these colors are determined by shared relationships. So um, I'll show in the next slide that these relationships mean something. So they kind of group together. Um, the largest nodes are in the middle. You know, they're the, they're the big planets in the, in the solar system. They're tracking everything. History is the largest. And then on the periphery, you get these smaller subject headings that are used less, but they still form kind of cohesive communities within themselves. So if I zoom in down to this little interesting grouping of people, not subject headings, um, you see dance. So then up here is folk dancing. And then even further down is sword dancing, deer dancing, animal dances, et cetera, et cetera. So the subject headings are kind of self-organizing together based on their uses in records. Um, and you can do stuff like click on one and say, oh, you know, I knew about sword dancing, but I didn't know about deer dancing. Like, I might check that out at the library. <laughs> so then you can click on it, and now, you know, we have 14 resources about that. That's, you know, awesome. So, so this is kind of an interesting way to think about how things organize. Um, there's a search feature. This is one of my favorites. So werewolves, it tries to get you to around it, where it is. So, so we have werewolves, and they're, they're related to vampires. That makes sense. Um, <laughs> paranormal fiction, like that, that makes sense. Paranormal romance stories, pretty close to vampires. You know, I mean, if you think about books, you know, that seems like that would exist. That's a thing. Um, so, and all of these, um, and you might say like, oh, I'm really interested in paranormal romance, and go check that out. Um, so all of these things exist within a larger cluster of, of, of fiction. And so you can see that this, this does work. It does kind of self-organize correctly, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's always perfect. So for example, if you have things that aren't self-organizing very well, you kind of end up with this kind of <laughs> float, <laughs> float some kind of compression of unrelated subject headings. But that's okay. I mean, you want data to be perfect, but data is not perfect, and it will never be, so it's okay. Um, and so it's interesting, because this is kind of like an institutional graph, right? This is, this is the strengths of the New York Public Library. This is what's available, and this is what we have. Um, so I, I kind of showed this earlier. I did a kind of like a, a, a really basic kind of overlay of what I thought some of the nodes meant and what kind of you could relate to in terms of subjects. And this is kind of bears true. We do have a large arts and humanities. We have a very large performing arts um, library. And so this makes sense. Um, so how would you go about kind of making this? Um, to do this, you have to go through about four steps. You have to compile these mark records into these relationships. Um, then you need a tool that renders these relationships in a kind of physics simulation to get the positions of these nodes after, after the end of the simulation. Um, you have to take that information uh, and make some sort of visual interface, and then you know, it's nice to have it on the web, so you gotta make some sort of web version of it. Um, to compile these mark records into node edge relationships, I just use PyMark um, to process them into uh, a, a Gephi document, which is the, the simulation we're gonna be using. And that's just like, uh, it turned out to be like a gigabyte XML, so it wasn't very fun. Um, so, so then you need a tool to take, take this document and render it and do this, these layout um, algorithms. And so I'm using Gephi. Um, Gephi is pretty well known. It it's, has a, a really wonderful GUI interface, but when you have 400,000 nodes, it can't, you can't do that in a GUI. It's too much. So a, a bunch of smart people took all the algorithms out of Gephi and put them into its own um, Java jar file, and you can import that Java jar file into your own Java application and use those, those layouts and algorithms. So that's what I did. I, I used, um, it's called the Gephi Toolkit to um, import those algorithms and run it on my data. So you can run this from the command line as opposed to you know, trying to do it from within a GUI. Um, and I wanted to show you what that looks like if you run it. So this is, um, this takes, took about five days to run to completion. And I, I shouldn't say completion, it's nowhere near complete, it could run for much longer. But um, I had to take a picture of itself every, every 50 clicks. So every, 
every time it moved everything 50 times, it took a picture, and this is a t kind of a time-lapse video of that. Um, so it takes a long time. It can only do things, it can only move everything around t twice a minute. So it does take a really long time. And if I had, like, uh, this was done on, like, a, f a four core, uh, 16 gigabyte computer, so you need some pretty hefty hardware to, to run it. Um, so even after, and again, this is kind of time intensive, so if you set the gravity too high and on day three the graph looks terrible, like, okay, well, we gotta start over. So it is a very um, time sensitive thing. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, you would take that information to cut the tiles, et cetera, et cetera, and I have some code for you if you want to start playing around with your networks and start trying to build your own things. So thanks very much. I like shiny things in the morning. That was shiny, thank you. Next up. <laughs> Next up is Cynthia Ning. Ning? Ning. Ning. <laughs> or Artie Chan, if you're familiar with Twitter or IRC. And she will be presenting on We Are All Disabled. Universal Web Design, Making Web Services Accessible for Everyone. And you're from? Uh, it's called Caper BC. Caper BC. How's the Langara College in Vancouver? And yes, these two little guys are required. I'm gonna try to actually figure out how to make this work. <sighs> Becky was laughing at me because she knows how much sleep I lost over this presentation. Um, so I want to apologize right now because I'm talking on accessibility and usability and despite that, uh, I've been using these, this slide template for months and only last week did someone actually come up to me and tell me that they can't read it when it's projected on a big screen and then they sit at the back of a room. So thank you to the person who finally came up to me and told me about this because I did check the color contrast, but of course didn't realize that when you sit at the back of the room with lighting and everything else, that actually needs to be a lot bigger. So if you're having issues reading the title of this slide, here is the bit.ly link. I created a bit.ly just for you. Uh, I to posted it on Twitter, IRC, and it's right here on the screen for you. Oh, it's also on Lanyard if you're using that. So yes, I am from uh, Caper, BC, which is Hazlet Linger um, College in Vancouver, but anyone who knows me knows that I live the life with the contract librarian, and who knows where, where I will be in, you know, a couple of months. So, wrapped audience that you are being the morning of day two. Oh wait, that's the wrong one. This is going to be lightning talk pace because this was originally an hour long presentation. Uh, so, if you don't have time to write anything down, I will be posting the slides, oh, right, lightning talk. I will be posting the slides and my notes and everything online. Uh, and if you thought Bo Young had a lot of slides with 60, I have 72 plus the link is 73. <laughs> so, we're here this morning to talk about web accessibility. Uh, but what is web accessibility? Most commonly it's defined this way. Uh, where it means that people with disabilities can use the web. But people with disabilities are a minority, and not all of them need actual special consideration for web accessibility, right? Okay, that's true. We may be surprised by, a, by the fact that in Canada and the US, the number of people with a disability, uh, wait, oh, oh, what happened? This is actually, sorry. There we go. Um, the number of people with a disability is larger than any single ethnic or visible minority in their respective countries. That's a lot of people. If that's not enough, if that's not enough, how about avoiding any legal issues? Okay, so in the US we have the Rehabilitation Act, has a couple of particularly relevant sections stating that basically no one can be excluded from uh, any federally funded uh, program and de detailing what web accessibility guidelines you have to follow. 
Many states also have their own legislation that either simply establish the same regulations for anything state funded or might extend it further into what we actually use in Canada, which is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, also known as just WebCAG for a lot of people because otherwise it's too long to say every single time. Uh, additionally, Americans with Disabilities Act provides civil rights to people with disabilities, much like the Civil Rights Act does for based on race or religion. So as I mentioned in Canada, uh, Canadian legislation says that we need to follow WebCAG. Um, although interestingly in Canada, it's only the federal government and the province of Ontario. We're, I think the rest of Canada is still kind of working on that. Your institution might also have a related mandate or policy. Anyone who knows that that's actually part of their mandate or policy? Yeah, at least a few of you might want to look it up. Uh, and maybe you just want to help people because we're all information professionals. Um, well, yeah, we're all kind of people who just want to help people, right? That's why we're here, sharing knowledge and information. Okay, so we've decided that people with disabilities need to be taken into consideration. Now what? The most commonly thought of excessive technology that people think about when making websites accessible is a screen reader. But that's not the only one. So how do we develop with, for people with disabilities? You want to make a list of all the assistive technology you might need to take into consideration, but that means defining the term. You don't know what it is, so you know, you go look it up on Wikipedia. Because why not? Actually, you probably search on it and Wikipedia is actually the first hit you get. I'm not going to actually read this whole thing to you, um, but basically what it says is that you, assistive technology is something that helps you complete a task. Simple enough. So just a few examples of other assistive technology. You might use a magnifier, you might use a browser zoom feature pointing device that's not actually a mouse. But wait, if assistive technology is simply technology that helps the user complete a task, then you might also need to take into consideration users that only use a keyboard or people not using either a mouse or a keyboard at all. So here's a quick question. How many of you regularly use a touch screen? Hey. I imagine every hand actually should have gone up because if you have a smartphone, you do, right? And there are other people who use smart boards and whatever else. How many of you would, would say that a keyboard, mouse, touch screen, or a combination of those help you accomplish a task you would otherwise not have been able to do otherwise? Uh, come on, I think every single hand should go up. So all this technology is assistive technology. Please stop and think about this for a moment. About how it applies to your work, to your organization. How might this one statement change the development process, not only for websites, but technology projects and all your other services? Because Hendren goes on to make another point. While not a new one is an important one, there is no average or normal user. We are not developing for a specific person or piece of technology for that matter. We can't. There are too many potential devices and ways people are using devices to do that. And these are, this is just Android mobile by the way. We aren't even, uh, so we're developing for potential situations. What's the solution? Move away from the approach of building separately for disabled users and concern yourself with creating clean, beautiful, usable, and accessible websites. Which brings us to universal design. Universal design is the design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. Ron Mace, by the way, was the architect who coined the term and founded the Center for Universal Design at nearby NCSU. One of the most well-known examples is the wheelchair ramp. I'm certain everyone can think of at least one other group of people that would use ramps beside wheelchair users. And many places now call it an access ramp or just ramp to reflect its greater universal application. And many parts of the website can be thought of the same way. If you look closely at the web content accessibility guidelines, for example, we can see many guidelines that would, not, uh, that would apply not only for users with disabilities, but for all users. Having consistent navigation. 
having a meaningful order to your content, providing multiple ways to discover content. That means kind of like having a menu bar and then a search box. That's pretty much all they mean. So while the principles are created with physical space in mind, they can and have been uh, adapted for web development. At this point, let's make the assumption that you think that universal design is a good idea and continue with this, uh, and go with the scenario that you're redesigning or designing a new website. Well, we still wanna go through all the usual development methods. Let's do a content inventory. Let's do a card sort. Let's, you know, let's do a task analysis. And whatever else you deem necessary. The idea here is that you wanna keep your users the main focus and that you ask your users, again, and again, uh, at all stages of development. Later on, doing usability testing uh, with mock-ups and prototypes. But once you have an idea of what will go into your website and how it might be used, you, of course, want to create your website. Considering that you want your website to work across devices and browsers, the key strategies you should be applying are mobile-first, progressive enhancement, and responsive design. I'm not going to go to detail on any of these practices because each one of these are sessions in and of themselves. I'm sure most of you sitting in this room probably know that. But instead I want to turn to some details that are more specific to web accessibility. I think most people by now are familiar with alt text. Um, of course alt text being specific to images, all media should actually have a text alternative. Frequently for video and audio that means a transcript. But speaking of media, nothing on your website should ever autoplay. <laughs> autoplay can actually lead to issues for those with special medical conditions, and I'm not just talking about people with disabilities. Needless to say, you also want to avoid anything blinking or flashing, because we all love that marquee HTML tag still, don't we? You may be thinking that nothing on your organization's website autoplays, but what about that carousel? Just one example of the problems with carousels is that they are frequently not keyboard accessible. Try changing the image using the left and right arrow keys the next time you see one and see if you get the previous or next image in the carousel. That's just one of many. Uh, by the way, do check out that website, shouldiuseacarousel.com. A website should be fully accessible, meaning that a user should be um, able to properly navigate and interact with your website using only a keyboard. Generally, that means you should be able to hit the tab key and go from one link to the next through form fields in order, because we've all had that issue where you go to the phone number instead of the city after putting in your street name, um, and never be trapped anywhere on your website. Ideally, your users should be able to easily see which field they're on, which link they're focused on, and then it's a small thing, but skip links allow readers, uh, screen readers and keyboard only users to skip blocks of content that are repeated on every page, such as the header and menu area. And ideally they can actually see the link when they're focused on it. And it wouldn't be code for live without some code, especially since I'm not doing data, data visualization up here. So here's how easy it is to do it. Add a link with the CSS class, add the CSS class to hide it from the visual user, and then make it visible again when they tap through. Finally, we get to Accessible Rich Internet Application Suite, or ARIA. Basically, it's a way to add attributes to your code to make your site more accessible by telling a screen reader what role your elements play. Many of the basic roles would normally be taken care of by the new HTML5 elements, such as nav for navigation, but the combination of browsers and screen readers admittedly have not caught up to properly implementing the relationships. For, so for now, you might actually have to add it. So most developers will readily admit to you that they look things up all the time, and with web accessibility, that's no exception. There are lots of resources out there, and I have a list of just a few that I find useful. But of course there are also lots of frameworks out there, templates and themes that are accessible as well. If you use Bootstrap, go check out the uh, accessibility plugin that PayPal just released, uh, I don't know, a while back now. Uh, I actually just recently uh, put up some code on GitHub, which is an accessible 
child theme for the default 2012 uh, WordPress theme to make it keyboard accessible and add in a few other things, including increasing the contrast. And of course, with some time and magic, at least the prototype website is created and you want to put it through some tests. There are lots of tools to check your code and many people have their preferences. These are just the ones that I use using W3C Validator to validate your code itself and you notice that that actually has an error message which is why I need to fix it when I get back to work. Um, there's HTML Code Sniffer um, which is great because it'll not only check Section 508 or WebCAG, but it'll also check whatever you're logged in to something because it's a bookmarklet. Uh, contrast Checker, which is a Firefox plugin. Wave Toolbar, you can see, this is outline only, so this pulls out all the headers from your website and you can see whether it actually makes sense. Uh, screen Reader Emulators, uh, you know, there's, there's tons, okay? So once you've caught any errors by these tools, then you can do your accessibility test with real world users. Finally, your website is complete and the only thing left is to add some content. But at this point, you need to rely on other people to be the content creators. And we all know that humans are the problem because you can control your code, but you can't control the humans, <laughs> at least not yet. So nevertheless, we can mitigate problems by keeping it simple. When I train staff at adding content, I give them a few simple guidelines. Use headers properly, use descriptive links, describe your images, and if you embed your video or audio, please add a link to the actual page, be clear and concise, and that's it. Five simple guidelines for the staff. So, what you can or cannot do really will depend on your role, your CMS, and your organization, but this maybe will help you. That what matters is an actionable process, possible to use, adapted to the company's culture, and financially effective. So if all you can do is provide your content creators with guidelines similar to the ones I've just shown you, you're already making your content more accessible. You've taken one step forward. I hope you weren't disappointed. Today's session wasn't explicitly to tell you how to develop or code your website necessarily, but help you think about web accessibility. Because access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. And a website should be fully keyboard accessible, meaning that, it, uh, sorry. Oh, I see this is the problem with having a script, right? You're on the wrong page. Of course, this is not, um, it's not about how to include users with disability, because if we all need assist technology, then we're all really disabled. While there are a few considerations we might not normally think about, if you only take one thing away today, it's this. Universal usability is simply good design, and I would say the same thing about universal design. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Oh, holy crap, that was lightning talk fast. That was, there's four minutes left if anyone actually wants to ask me a question. Yeah, he can shout it, I'll repeat it. Don't worry. No, no just, just shout it at me, I'll repeat it to everyone. <laughs> so much easier to try to pass a mic, isn't it? And you gotta turn it on, of course. Okay, um, all I was gonna say is that another way to sell universal design is what you're doing is making your website um, semantically meaningful and easily used by machines. Google bots, Bing bots are machines, and so we, you end up with a site that's easier to crawl and be more meaningful with results, so you can sell it to your organization that way too. Thank you. John. Can you hear me? Turn it on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, how's that? All right, well, I'll just talk loud. And, um, I have one question. Keyboard accessibility always kind of confuses me a little bit. Are there like any guidelines or standards? Because I'm never really sure what to add or what to put. Um, I, I, I know my presentation was lightning talk fast, so you might have missed it, but really I just used the tab key. Tab key's one. Tab key. <laughs> if you can tab through your website and you can see which links you're focused on, you can see which form fields or input fields in general that you're focused on, that's all you need. Oh, and of course, it needs to, you know, go in an order that makes sense. Uh, <laughs> but that's it. That's all I do. I 
I just wanted to make a, another comment to follow up on your comment, and that's that um, you know, doing things and ensuring that your content and your websites are standards compliant is also a way to help future-proof the work you've done because uh, you know, features do get deprecated <clears throat> and uh, things, assistive technologies like screen readers, they tend to focus on being able to handle the things that are standards compliant. So there, there's some other things you can use as a, as a way to leverage your organization towards universal design. Um, so thank you for pointing out so many web accessibility guidelines and tools that already exist uh, for people to reference. Do you feel like there's currently a gap of a particular kind of accessibility that you wish it were easier to test or, uh, or design to with a pre-existing tool or framework, but you're like, someone needs to build that? I don't know that there is. I mean, much like usability in general, it's really hard to automate a lot of testing. So, you know, you make your code as good as you can and you, you use the methods that you have, but the only way to make your site or any service or technology that you're using really usable and accessible for everyone is to test it, which is why, you know, I make the point of you need to ask your users again and again, and it's every stage of development. You know, it's, it's you do it early and you do it quickly as much as you can. So, I mean, I'm a one-man shop, so to speak, in my organization, um, and in terms of the website, I kind of have been for quite a while at different organizations. So, I mean, you do a card start with your users, you do the mock-ups, guerrilla testing with your users, you do, you know, you do some real world kind of user testing, but you do what you can yourself as well. I mean, it's just, that's all there is to it with usability. It's you test it again and again. It's that iterative process. Everyone talks about it, and that's really no different when it comes to accessibility. For those of you who have empty chairs, raise your hands so those people can uh, not stand for one more talk. All right. What? No. In the front. All right. And actually, one thing came on uh, Twitter that uh, for the uh, Portland folks for 2015 might want to consider. Um, either having a signer or having access to a auto closed caption for the talks here. So that might be something to open up a little bit more accessibility for the in-person conference for next year. Next, our last presentation before break is from Dre. I'm not even going to a attempt to pronounce well, your last on, name. I tried it with the Norwegian. <laughs> Orphanites? Very close. Orphanides. Orphanides, thank you. Um, dead simple video content management. Let your file system do the work. Somehow giving a talk is way more nerve-inducing than being MC, even though I think the uh, possible consequences of disaster for giving a talk are far lower than the consequences of failing as an MC. So, I don't know. <sighs> Slides! Okay, you guys can see it, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so my name's Dre. Uh, I work um, at NC State. Um, my position title is something like Librarian for Digital Technologies and Learning. And what that means is so hard to explain, but uh, one of the things I do is I manage the like instructional tutorial videos for the reference department. And 
So we were having some problems with our instructional videos. It was a giant mess. Um, there were some serious content management issues in the web part of the uh, uh, of our instructional space. There were just tons and tons of files. It was a headache to even try to like think about managing it because there was just too much stuff. It was overwhelming. Um, and the act of adding a video to our collection involved lots of work repetition, like me opening files and changing strings of text and stuff like that. Um, the content was everywhere, so there were like six different directories that I would have to touch in the web space every time I wanted to add or edit a video. And because we had tried like a kajillion different ways to manage the videos, there was a whole bunch of leftover stuff that we were no longer using. Um, so the solution to a video management problem, of course, or a content management problem, of course, is a content management solution, and so I made one. Um, so I, I wanted to just use basic content management principles like separating the content from the display, um, getting all of that content into logical units so I didn't have to touch six different directories every time I wanted to do something. Um, and I wanted to do it with just as, as little scripting as I could possibly do it. Um, so to give you an idea of the problem, here's what our uh, video directory looked like. This is the website. Uh, this is what our web directory for video tutorials looked like before. It was just too much. Um, there was like 80 files in there or something. I didn't actually count. Um, and if we were to look at like, s here are six arbitrary directories from that previous page that, that uh, I showed you. And they all have exactly one file in them called index.html. Um, and if we were to look at the files themselves, they did a little diff here. The differences between each of those index.html are the titles are different, the file names that they're pointing to for the videos are different, and the credits are different. Um, and so so this tells us something about the kind of stuff that we shouldn't be doing by hand, which I will get to. Uh, part three, if we look at all of the things that I need to touch potentially in order to add a video, uh, well, here's where the video source files live, here's where the caption files live, here's where the thumbnails for the videos live, here's where the flash video player lives, and the flash video player we were using needed a config file for each video, and those live there. And then we have these directories with the index files, and I would just always have to add one every time I wanted to add a new video. Um, and then part number four, if we look over on the staging server, I have a very bad habit of developing in the staging area, um, but that's a separate issue. But what ends up happening is, uh, if we look at the videos that we're actually using uh, in current practice, we have that and nothing else. Um, and so all of this other stuff is just left over, and there's, you know, I needed basically to tear everything down and start over again. Um, and so I wanted to keep the solution simple. The way I did it was I made a single script, actually two scripts, uh, for video playback. In effect, replacing myself with a small script like you're supposed to do. Um, and uh, as a nice side effect, I could get rid of all those little subdirectories for all the different videos. Um, I'm going to put the, put the video and the associated metadata somewhere else. We actually have a video server, but this could, if you were doing it yourself, for instance, just be a different directory. Um, so we're separating content and display, like you're supposed to, and put all the video and the metadata in one place to make it easier to manage. Um, and of course, we want to actually put the video with its metadata, which I know is a novel concept. Um, because, you know, we want to keep things in logical units, and then if I go and look in the directories where the videos live, there's exactly one directory that exists for each video, and it's self-inventorying, it's awesome. Um, so that was the kind of thrust behind my solution. It's so simple. How simple is it? It's so simple. <laughs> But I feel a little guilty being up here taking your 20 minutes, but that's okay. All right, so the basic premise of the solution is this. We're going to go over to the web server. We're going to make a request for my video. And then my script is going to go over to the video server and look for a directory called my video. And then the script on the web server will draw a page and then stick in the links to the video from that, that we got from the video server. It's pretty straightforward. And hey, it's MVC because I've got... Uh, index.php, which is interpreting the request, and then I've got this script number two, the display video script, which is actually doing the drawing of the web page. And then uh, the key interesting part here, I think, is that I'm letting the file system do what the file system does well, and I'm having it, it be the model. Um, so the video files and the metadata associated to each video lives on the file system, each video in its own directory. 
Um, so here's kind of what the workflow looks like. Uh, you know, we, we get the request, we check to see if the directory exists, and if not, we give a 404. Um, and then we check to see if the files that we need to actually render the video page are there, and if not, we, we know something's wrong, so I decided we would throw a 500 a server error there. And if everything works out well, we take the XML file with the metadata and the title that has the title and description in it, and we draw that stuff on the page, and we stick the links for the video in the page, and then everyone's happy and they can watch the video. Uh, one of the interesting things for me personally was I had never played with mod rewrite before, um, and it's a kind of a nifty tool, and so I thought I would go through quickly what the mod rewrite is doing. Um, the first two directives there basically say, hey, if actual files exist in this directory, serve those first, because I knew I was going to be doing a lot of cleanup as I proceeded through this process, and I wanted to allow the legacy files to be there until I was ready to get rid of them. And then the interesting part is the second part, and basically what we're doing there is we're just taking, assuming that the, that the request is not serving an actual file, just take the whole request and send it to index.php. And so the way it works is this. Uh, we got little uh, 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 regex here that says take the entire URL, call index.php and pass it the entire URL, and then there's these other little things here that or mean something in mod rewrite, and this one says, hey, if there's any existing query parameters, stick them at the end, and then stop rewriting the URL, because potentially there could be more directives below. Um, mod rewrite is one of those things where like, you never ever touch it until you need to touch it, and then you look up everything that you need to do and then forget it. Um, but it, 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 this was my first time having that experience, so I thought I would share. All right, so if we go over to the video server and we look at the directories, basically what's happening is, Every time uh, I make a directory, I'm, I'm saying, hey, this is a video that I'm going to be, that I am asserting we can serve to the user. So we might have a video called my video. We have a directory on the video server called my video. Here's a directory for uh, my other video and a directory for the best video. I am, by making these directories on the video server, asserting that the video is something the user can access. Um, and so the way we do that is if we look in what's inside one of these video uh, directories, it has its various contents. The first thing it has is the actual video files themselves. Now, at a bare minimum, these are what's needed to actually allow the user to view a video. So if either of these files is missing, and we have two versions for, you know, web HTML5 compatibility. We're not going to talk about that right now. But if either of those is video, video files is missing, we say server error. I am making the assertion that you can play this video, but something essential to make that video play is missing, so something's wrong on the server level. We also have this other stuff in the directory, the XML file with the metadata, a caption file, and a poster image. Um, and so if we look in the XML file, we have kind of the basic information that you use to describe the video around it. And right now, what I've got in those XML files is the title, a very brief blurb, um, some credits, which I kind of made some structure to allow us to describe the roles in the, in the video creation process, and then some license, which is usually just a Creative Commons license. Um, and so naturally, this is where people like us have questions. Why did I use XML? I'm doing all the XML editing by hand, and uh, JSON is really annoying to edit by hand. Uh, also, six simple XML is really easy to work with, and I'm really lazy. Um, and so it's easy to just throw pointy brackets around things. And so that's why I'm using XML. There's no reason I couldn't do it with some other structured data text file. Um, and then the next question is, show us what your XML looks like. No. No one wants to look at XML on the screen because you can squint at it and, you know, whatever. Uh, but um, it's pretty ad hoc. Basically, I just took things and I threw pointy brackets around them. Um, uh, I will provide some examples uh, in a link so you can look at it and see what's there. Now, you'll notice that the XML file was not required, not listed as one of the required files. So we want to be able to take a stab at serving the video if for some reason just the video files are there with nothing else. And so what we do in that case is we take the file name, which is the same as the directory name, and we just kind of intuit what a reasonable video, uh, video name might be. And so we can do it very easily. If we've got camel case, we'll just split on camel case. 
If we're using underscores or other punctuation, we'll just split on the underscores and take a guess of the video. But of course, I'm not a mind reader, so if the video is not named in a useful way for doing this, you know, you get what you get. Um, since this is a failure case, failure is okay. Uh, but this is better than, than doing absolutely nothing or saying the person can't watch the video when the video file exists. So here are the, wow, I'm going really fast. This is awesome. Um, so conclusions. I like this a lot. It's simple. There's only two scripts, and then I was like editing the scripts the other day, and I was actually surprised. I surprised myself at how short the scripts were. It was amazing. Um, and it centralizes the content management. I can just go over to the video server, make a directory, drop the files in, and then the video exists on the website. It's nice. It's self-inventorying, like I said, so I can go over to the video server and look at the directories that are there, and those are the videos that I have put on and that I've posted. It keeps the web space nice and clean. Uh, this technique in general would work anywhere that you can run a script as long as you can grab that UR request URL and process it. And it fails pretty gracefully um, because at a bare minimum, all we need to give the user access to the videos is just the video files themselves. So to give you an idea of how this has made my life easier, um, recall that this is what the web directory looked like at the start. And then after implementing the script with the barest minimum of cleanup that I could do, it looked like this. And there's plenty of cleaning left for me to do that I just haven't gotten around to, especially as, as I add a few more features to, um, to the service to like enable galleries and stuff like that. So, of course, this is really, really simple, um, and like all really, really simple things, there are a number of limitations. Because we don't actually have this content on our web server, there's, um, the videos themselves don't actually exist on the web server. In theory, there could be a problem with indexing the content, but as long as you're using like a spider-type web indexer, all you need to do is create a gallery page somehow. And I haven't actually made a function to create a gallery page, but it'd be very simple to do. Just go over to the video server, look at all the directories there, and then make a link for each directory. Um, so that's an easy problem to solve. The big one for me is that the metadata is really limited. Um, the only the only way that we've made metadata is without any context other than the video itself. But for me, as an instruction librarian, you know, I might want to be able to point to a collection that's good for starting your research, uh, uh, point to a different collection, which is, you know, how to search for books. Um, I haven't figured out a good way to create like a tagging system or make collections of videos because uh, the way I've done the metadata and the structure is just very, very flat. I'm sure there's some solution I could make, uh, but it would probably just have to be bolted on rather than integral to the way that I've done um, the architecture here. Hey, that's an idea. I hadn't thought of that. It's so profoundly simple. Maybe I'll do that. Um, so, and then another problem is, is, you know, one of the things we like about true content management systems is it isolates content creators from the, the guts of the system. And right now, I haven't done that. If I wanted one of my fellow reference librarians to post a video, they would have to go mount the video server as a directory, create a subdirectory, create an XML file, dump the files into the directory they just made. But I think this is pr probably easy to solve with web forms or something. And the fact is that right now I'm doing all of this work myself and I'm in the reference department, so I'm like the guy who does it. It's not a big deal. But I think it would be easy to solve uh, in a more durable way by making a simple web form tool to allow uploading files and editing XML or you know, a form to populate XML. And then there's a the big question of how does this correspond or not with your own organization's content management policy? Uh, at NC State, we are, in theory, a Drupal shop. There's no Drupal here. Um, the, I'm one of those people who just, you know, they, for some reason they let, you know, make HTML files and without consequences. And so I didn't actually ask anyone on the Drupal team if doing this approach would be okay, and so I apologize, Angie wherever you are. Um, I think she's in the audience somewhere, I don't know. Um, but 
that, that be, that, that's bes right now, besides the point. Uh, but it is something you should think about if you're going to implement a system like this. How is this going to fit in with however your institution um, manages its content in a, in a kind of bigger picture way? But I think the technical implementation of a solution like this uh, should be pretty straightforward. As long as you can get that URL and process it with some script, which I'm pretty sure you can do, for instance, in Drupal um, without any special you know, goodness, um, you should be able to implement a, a solution like this. Uh, this ri raises the natural question, why didn't I just do this in Drupal in the first place? Um, well, we are technically a Drupal shop, but we are still deep in the throes of transitioning from being, you know, straight HT docs type of stuff. And so there's a lot of stuff that's way higher on the priority list than dealing with instructional videos. And so even if we did decide to solve this problem with Drupal in some way, um, this is, is light enough and fast enough to implement as an interim solution. And so I don't feel bad that I'm doing work that might someday be retired. That being said, I think it won't be that hard to integrate with Drupal if we decide to go that way. Um, and so I've got code and examples and um, uh, <laughs> I got the code, I got this slideshow and I've got some example XMLs um, at this URL. I'll make sure this gets posted somewhere um, so that you don't have to remember an arbitrary string of numbers and letters. Um, and so are there any questions? There's three minutes left for exciting questions. Yes, Charlie. <laughs> Charlie's one of our Drupal guys. Please turn on the mic. Uh, well, it's not going to work now. Yeah. Hey, it's on now. Oh, it's working. Okay. Um, yeah, we should, we should talk. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah, let's talk. <laughs> we can coexist peacefully. I think it works. <laughs> okay. That was it. Okay. It looks cool. <laughs> All right, so that's it. Thank you. All right, and we are now on time for a break. So there is coffee and what? Break up. Oh, yes. So, um, one announcement, well, actually two announcements before we go to break. Um, one, if you're doing a lightning round talk this morning, please come up here and upload your slides or demos. And second, breakout sessions for the afternoon. If you have a breakout session idea that you want to have others talk about with you, go ahead and sign out in the lobbies right there. Enjoy your break. We are back at 11. Oh, one more. There is. What was that again? I didn't hear. Right at the top of the escalators. That's where the lightning talk signups are. I think we're still looking for some on Friday if you want to sign up there. I mean, Thursday. Sorry. Becky? Becky? Yeah? What's the incentive to return on time from break? Uh, we'll have a raffle, so you need to be back here by 11. talks we have a problem we have a poor lost apple brick who is looking for its owner it's sad it's crying it was at this front table right here in the morning so if you've lost your 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 uh, apple power block please come and get it at the podium now we have some shiny books to give away give it Hi. Um, we have um, several different stages of giveaways. Right now, we are in possession of 10 books from Pragmatic Programmers, um, or Pragmatic Publishing, 
Uh, I'll read off the titles so you can start drooling over which one you will pick if you are lucky enough to be chosen. We also have um, more items on the way, a list of books that would have been delivered but the publisher did not get them here in time, but we will have coupons in the box for them and uh, instructions on how to get the publisher to ship directly to you if you choose one of those. O'Reilly has also been gener enough, generous enough to um, provide a free ebook for every attendee of the conference, and there will be coupons printed and available at the registration desk <laughs> later. Um, so I, I believe Tim, Tim is the one who coordinated that, and that's awesome, and I, I, I can't wait. Um, so the, the books you have to choose from at the moment, if you are uh, lucky enough to win this round, um, from Pragmatic, we have Pragmatic Thinking and Learning, which is about refactoring your own brain. Um, two copies of Agile Development with Rails 4. Two copies of Seven Databases in Seven Weeks. <laughs> One copy of Seven Web Frameworks in Seven Weeks. Um, seven Languages in Seven Weeks was a great book, by the way, so I, I, these are probably good, too. Um, Practical Vim, that sounds thrilling to me. <laughs> Crafting Rails 4 applications, build awesome command line applications in Ruby 2, Node.js the right way, a very opinionated book, and <laughs> web development with Clojure. Clo I, Clojure. So um, if your name is called, uh, run on up and grab a book from the, the shelf. Bobby will be guarding the books, I guess. I, I, we, our, our roles here are loosely defined. Um, okay, cool. There's no drum roll, just me randomizing. Oh, thank you. And the winner of the first book, Sort Ascending. Yes, I use Excel as my picker. <laughs> Sean Carraway. And um, since we only have, let's give away one more now. We'll s probably slow down as it goes on, but since more are on the way. Our second winner, Nabil Kashyap. Did I get that right? <laughs> Congratulations, and I'll see you again later. Challenge getting the slides off. All right, woohoo! All right, I'm done. Thanks. Um, hi, uh, I'm Carolyn Cole, and this is my colleague Mike Tribone from uh, Penn State University, the department formerly known as DLT. We're in a reorg right now, so digital library technologies was what is what the area that we work in. Um, we're going to talk about uh, paired programming, the way that we have done it, not, not the way that everybody else has done it, so to, to kind of jump the skills gap. Um, so the normal definition of paired programming is that you've got two programmers working together, one's typing, one's falling asleep. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, th this, uh, whenever I think of that, I'm like, oh, pair programming, pair programming? <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, it is, it's two people working together to solve the problem, but is it really two people working together or one person just kind of snoozing off? So um, what, what we're assuming with paired programming is that two people are working together, there's a single computer, that's part of the definition. What really worked for us was we actually have two people with very disparate skill sets. I am the back-end gal, and this is my user interface guy. Uh, and our superpowers united to uh, work on a very complex problem that we had a short amount of time to, uh, to deal with. So um, 
We were both working. We had two computers. We had uh, an additional screen where we were sharing uh, our time, and, and nobody was bored. Um, so what we were working on, uh, where this is where I plug Archive Sphere. So uh, Penn State it has Scholar Sphere that you heard about last year if you were here. And so Archive Sphere, I like to think of it as like kind of the baby brother. Uh, it's based on the same Hydra stack. Uh, but it's just for our archivists. It's only for one user at the moment, very little data, first phase, it's it. But anyway, because of that, because it's just one user, nobody wanted to spend a lot of time on the user interface. But I mean, you can't put something out there and have them hate it. So that's, that's where we, we work together. We said, we're going to work together. I could only have Mike's time for what? I was half a day. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I'm an engineer uh, that, you know, I, I put things up, they work for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, someone else, they might not, you know, might not find it. So, uh, so that was, that was what we were working on. Oh, I like that picture. Uh -huh, you like that? Yeah. Thanks. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so we had a short amount of time and we had to jump that, we had to jump that skills gap. You know, we had back end girl and UI guy. Um, I'm proficient in HTML, CSS, and a little bit of bootstrap. Carolyn knows the system structure, the language, and the environment, and our schedule is really tight. So paired programming to the rescue. What we did was, in the Knowledge Commons at the Petit Library, we used this technology here. It's a little glass room. Uh, you, I think at least four people can plug in, and you have uh, a shared screen, and there are these little pucks so that you can tap in and share your screen at any time. So what we did was we worked together, sharing code snippets and working out the problem. She knows the environment. I'm, I know more of the front end. Uh, and what we started with was a fixed width, super customized, overridden version of Bootstrap 2, uh, ugly and clunky. And we had a very unhappy end user, one guy. Uh, and then the final result was we had a clean UI, we had a happy end user, uh, and the two of us learned some new tricks. Uh, it also works for paired presenting. So the, <laughs> the left slide is the slide that Carolyn gave to me and she actually kicked off this talk. Uh, and the slide on the right is what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi. 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 This is me. Um, so uh, I'm Mark Marienzo. I work at the Digital Public Library of America. I hope you've heard of us. And I want to talk about something that I worked on um, using Twilio just recently. So uh, Twilio is a platform as a service provider that allows you to make and receive phone calls um, and send and receive SMS messages. It's really cool. So, and you can um, interact with people who are using their phones using REST, which is also very cool. Um, it's not new to Code for Lib. Um, Mike Beccaria did, had, wrote a, an article for the Code for Lib Journal um, in 2011. Um, my slides will be up. And so part of the reason why I was really attracted to Twilio is that it's really fun. Um, I was inspired by some work that the folks at the, the Cooper Hewitt Museum did to prototype a way to be able to interact with their collections. So they've been, so the Cooper Hewitt has been closed for a couple of years while they renovate the entire building. And they're thinking about how to engage their audiences using you know, since the building is not open, they, they still want to in, maintain that audience engagement. So I came up with this idea to create something called dial a DPLA, which provides access to sound items in DPLA. So I'm going to do a live demo on my phone, and I hope you can hear it, and I hope it works. But um, if you want to follow along at home, you can call, call 704-288-DPLA. So... Give me one second. Welcome to Dial a DPLA. Today we are providing access to Kentucky Digital Library's Claude Sullivan audio recordings. Please enter a four digit year of recording followed by the pound key. You are about to 
Division Two, UK, Auburn basketball game. This item is from University of Kentucky. So sometimes it doesn't always work, but <laughs> if you if you do want to follow along at home, um, I suggest years in the 1960s or late 50s. So this is a 50-line Python app, which is really, really cool. Um, I wrote it using the Flask framework. And so what it does is it does a search against the a DPLA API. So you, you give it um, a four-digit year, and um, it, it, does, it searches specifically within one collection in, at, at this point, the, the Kentucky. So there we go. Buffering. <laughs> anyway, so it does a search against the DPLA API, and uh, it pulls back an item with, a, a, with an, an associated MP3. So the application serves up XML in this format called TwiML, uh, which is then consumed by, uh, by Twilio. And so, and so part of the way that you end up interacting when you, when you deal with user prompts is, is you hand, have the application handle post requests. So because this is a library conference, you know, we need to have a sl some slides with XML on it. Um, th when you go to the root of the application, this is what my application serves up. And this is an example of TwiML. It's fairly straightforward. There are a number of different frame, um, sort of modules for different languages that allow you to kind of abstract this away. So you can just say, like, basically call a function with whatever string you want that will automatically construct this XML for you. And so this is an example of what it looks like. So this play, this play element allows you to refer to a, an MP3 file or another sound file on a server that you then pass into the, to the caller. So, it's very straightforward, it's really simple. Um, take a look at my code, it's up online, it's under the MIT license. Thanks. So my name's Corey Lown, I work at NCSU Libraries, and I like to look at search logs. <laughs> this chart has been haunting my dreams for a while. Over the last four years, I've noticed that our, the queries in our search box, our single search box, are getting longer. I sort of arbitrarily decided that queries with more than 80 characters are long. And they went from about just under 3% of searches to almost 10% of searches. When I took a sample of them, it looked like most of them were mostly known items. Um, they, some of them appeared to be copy and pasted from somewhere, maybe course syllabi, journal websites, maybe Google, I don't know. And for a set of these, the recall's really bad because they include things from citations like DOIs, volume information, issues, pages, abstracts, and our search tools seem to be really bad at dealing with this. You think, this is a query I took from the logs. You'd think it should work, right? This is in our collection. It has all the information about the article. You should be able to put this in the search box, and it should work. Nope. And you get a really not very useful did you mean message, which I'm not even sure what the difference is between the two. And you also get no results if you click on that. Google doesn't do any better, which made me feel somewhat better. And as you might imagine, it turns out if you remove that extra stuff from the end, you'll find the article you're looking for. So I have a few questions. Is this happening in your search box? Why is this happening? And my thought is I just look for long queries, see if there's some numbers and punctuation in it, strip that stuff out, and then send the query along to someone or wherever else. But is there a better way to fix this problem? That's it. Presentation here somewhere. Make the mic 
I don't think it matters if I'm mumbling. Maybe it does. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so is my pr presentation here? It was, oh, there it is. It's right in the middle. No wonder I can't find it. So I am going to, whoops. Okay, so how do I actually start this? <laughs> what? F5, great. Sorry, not from that, not from my planet. Um, anyway, so I'm going to talk everything about Drupal 8 in less than five minutes, so which won't be much. But uh, my name's Kerry Gordon. I've uh, been using Drupal for about nine years and involved with the project uh, for about eight of those years. Uh, and Drupal 8 is. Uh, a major sea change, it doesn't have much to do with the slides, but uh, it's a major sea change for the Drupal community and it reflects uh, the pain that a lot of people have had, uh, especially in the core Drupal community over the last few years and, and initiatives that actually have been, go back to at least 2008. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's nine, there are, no, I believe, nine major components of this, and I'm not going to run through them here because I'm going to run through them here. So uh, one of the first, it's, it's mobile-based. So it, it, one, of the, one of the design goals was to do mobile first, so it was built mobile from, I'm getting some feedback here, so I'm, it's a little annoying, but uh, so you can do everything in Drupal, at least in core Drupal 8 from your phone if you really want to. You can manage your site. All the management tools work. Uh, the, the base themes work. Of course, like anything that you can build on, you can totally destroy that if you try it. Um, multilingual, uh, multilingual is now built in. It, it, like many of the major initiatives in Drupal, it started as something that was bolted on and that had uh, a lot of drawbacks, especially when it came to uh, translating the interface and, and local interfaces. So now it's in core. Uh, configuration management, uh, like everyone, I, I try to only move content or move uh, data from uh, production to development and uh, only move code and configuration up. In, in previous versions of Drupal, configuration was in the database, almost impossible to do. Now, we're, we're, we've adopted a framework called Symfony, Symfony 2, and all of our settings file, all of our, our configuration is in YAML files and stored in the file system, so easy to move. Um, Built-in web services, I can't really talk too much about this other than it's uh, you know, certainly part of a move to separate the front end and the back end of Drupal. So right now we're working on a project in Drupal 7 where we have a couple projects where we have angular front ends. We're not using Drupal, uh, Drupal front end system, we're only using the content management side. Uh, it'll be easier to do in Drupal 8, uh, but won't be truly separate probably until Drupal 9. Authoring tools, so uh, this is more on the front end. Uh, we now have in-place editing in core, so you know, you can just, uh, content contributors or editors can just go to the page, they don't have to actually click on the uh, <coughs> Sorry, click on the edit button. They can just, they have that little pencil symbol and they can do a quick edit, which gets them uh, the ability to edit right in place. They see what they get. Uh, some of our clients just like to write HTML so they don't use this at all. But, uh, fast theming with Twig. Twig is, is a, uh, a uh, templating tool that's built based on Symfony by the people who built Symfony. So when we adopted Symfony into the project, theme, Twig seemed like a really good idea. We currently use something called PHP template, which is getting very long on the tooth, in the tooth. Uh, I don't have time to talk about that, so 
Uh, next, views out of the box. So uh, if you've used Drupal, you know the views is a very, very popular uh, uh, component. It's a, currently a module that you, you put into your Drupal site, but uh, now it is in core Drupal. So what that's allowed us to do is a lot of things in Drupal essentially look like views, but were each all developed separately. So you know, for our content lists, there was one set of code. For uh, the front page view, there was another. Okay, I think I'm pretty much done. We got fields, better markup with HTML5, and most of all, uh, Symfony. So Drupal one will be out soon, hopefully, uh, looking for a beta, hopefully this summer by DrupalCon and, uh, and, uh, and uh, release candidate this fall. Thanks, Mark, for closing that window. <clears throat> Where are we? Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Hillel. Uh, I work at the Rockefeller Archive Center, aka the Man. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, I love my I love my place of work. Um, all right. So this is my brother Alvin. He is not a chipmunk, um, but he does love to play Quidditch, um, really. If you don't know what Quidditch is, um, congratulations, <laughs> and Google it. Um, so it turns out that, can you all see that? It's like, OK. Um, so it turns out that there are actually a lot of people that, that play Quidditch. like. Seriously? Is there anyone here who's willing to confess to that? No, okay. Um, and, and there is actually a, um, an international organization um, that governs this sport such as it is. They have uh, this website with an extensive rule book, um, uh, some leagues, and a very complicated algorithm for ranking teams. As you might expect, there's a, a pretty strong correlation between nerds and Quidditch players. <laughs> And, and by the way, I just in case there's any question about it, I'm not at all making fun of any of this. This is a perfectly valid occupation for people. Um, and I'm talking about my brother, after all, who is my brother. Um, so the thing about my brother is that he not only likes to play Quidditch, but he's, he loves math and he loves numbers. And so he wanted to um, find a way to start recording statistics about, um, he's going to kill me if he ever finds out I gave this talk, um, <laughs> <coughs> record statistics um, for for players who play Quidditch at, at that level. So um, I thought, hey, this is a great learning opportunity. Um, what I didn't realize uh, at the time was that it would be a good learning opportunity for both of us to learn together, um, which is really what this talk is about. Um, so we started out, um, we made a little uh, very, very informal ontology to, to start expressing some of these ideas. Um, there's a GitHub repo, there's a site. Um, it's a, uh, just basically a little GitHub page, GitHub pages site. And um, so this is an opportunity for me to sort of pass along some of the things I've learned um, and picked up over, over the years, um, many of them from people here, um, from these kinds of presentations. So taught on the basis of the Git version control, um, Git and GitHub pages, um, a little bit about HTML and CSS, how to link things, um, and then a little bit about um, schema.org and, and linked data. Very, very basic stuff. We're not really getting into a lot of RDF. Um, so after that, um, then I started to knock together a little Angular web application um, to actually record statistics once we had the model a little bit more tightly defined. Again, GitHub repo and a uh, live site that might or might not work if everyone tries to go to it right now. Um, and this is sort of 
the way in which it's structured is pretty simple. There's a, a data stored in MongoDB and um, it uses a little plugin called user app IO for authentication um, to control different views um, and functions in the application. Um, and it runs on Node.js. It's very simple. So um, I obviously picked up a little bit of literacy in some of these um, technologies, which was great. Um, and then I was also able to, to uh, use some of those things for actual work work, which was um, also great. So um, this is the part where I try and make profound points in the minute and a bit that I have left. And I'll wave my hands a little bit. Um, so first of all, um, I think the, the thing that, that this showed me was that you know, the acts of, of creating and transforming and editing and, and changing data also change the things that the data is about. Um, and uh, think about uh, the box score and how it transformed baseball from a game that people play to a sport that where teams could be and players could be compared um, by numbers. Um, and so I think that's an interesting thing for us to think about, sort of our own agency, hey, to use that term. Um, and, and secondly, um, I've learned a lot from people in this room, um, and it was great for me to be able to pass some of that along. Um, and the, the back and forth, if you go look at some of the um, comment logs and some of the GitHub issues, you'll see us fighting about things. Um, and uh, I think that, that process of working things out together was really helpful and fun. Damn, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, my name is Jack Reed, I work at Stanford and I'm gonna talk about adding a map view to your Blacklight app. Uh, do you, you guys all know what Blacklight is? Yeah, okay, all right. There's a, if you don't, there's a table out there and I encourage you to go talk to uh, folks out there afterwards. And so um, I've been working on a plugin for Blacklight called Blacklight Maps over the past couple weeks and um, you can go check it out right now on GitHub. And today I'm gonna try to do a demo and uh, install uh, Blacklight Maps live on stage. Um, so what this does is it creates a map view uh, for results uh, for your Blacklight um, app. So I'm sure all of you have really rich uh, geospatial metadata for all your uh, solar indices, right? And you wanna take advantage of that in your discovery interface by creating a map view of results. So Monday morning, uh, tag this release. And uh, here's the demo time, so we have, so we have enough, um, have enough time, hopefully. Okay. So last night I spun up an EC2 instance and created a Rails app, added Blacklight to it, and this is just a vanilla Blacklight application with um, working here. And we can see that if I get my results, I have all these great results in a list view. And they're from all over the place here. So China, Tibet, India, all, all around the world. And so, hey, wouldn't it be cool if I could see all those on a map and see where everything's from in a map, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add the Blacklight Maps gem. Can y'all see this? No? All right. I'm editing my gem file and adding the Blacklight Maps gem to it. I'm saving it. I'm running bundle install. All right. So now, I'm running the Blacklight Maps generator. And that'll add some CSS and JavaScript stuff to the app. 
I'm going to restart my Rails application. And pray to the live demo gods. All right, so now I have a new uh, view over here, and it looks like a globe. It says map, and when I click on it, I can see my results on the map. Yeah. But wait, there's more. Um, I, I zoom in here, and so, and so one of the problems, you know, with displaying geospatial information is we, we're looking at, you know, we're looking at it at various scales. So we're doing some uh, clustering here to uh, try to uh, blurry that a little bit. But when I click on it, I can see the results here in my, um, in my list view. And then I can click through to, the, to its page. Um, so one more thing I'm going to do. How am I doing on time? A minute and a half. A minute and a half. Oh, man. So I have some configuration options here. So maybe I don't like that base map. That's the default uh, OpenStreetMap base map. And maybe I want a satellite view as my base map. So I can just configure that in the catalog controller. And then when I refresh, is it going? You guys are all hitting it at once, right? Now, so now I have a satellite view for my base map. So it's, it's configurable in different ways. And so I made GIFs last night of all this because I didn't know if the live demo would actually work. But also here, and I'm not sure if you can see it, but if you have thumbnails, um, thumbnails defined, your thumbnails appear in the sidebar list, and that's, and, uh, that, that's also configurable. Uh, so next up, we want to implement spatial search. So where I'm viewing at the map, it only returns results from that area. Uh, latitude, longitude support. So right now, um, we support bounding, bounding block boxes and place names with coordinates. And so just support um, just latitude and longitude coordinates. And also your pull request. So please contribute uh, to this and add any issues. And I want to thank everybody who's uh, handled pull requests, uh, contributed information on this project, and thank you. All right, hey everyone. Um, I'm a little bit nervous with public speaking, so all of you look great in your underwear. Um, <laughs> all right, let me go ahead and get this thing going. Um, view, F5, someone said? F5, F5. okay. Um, so first I want to interact with one of the other lightning talkers. Uh, Brown University has a killer citation parser that's open source that maybe you can send your long citations to and it'll return back a parse citation even letting you know that it was a citation, so that might be an idea for sending all those queries to those crappy vendor-based discovery systems. Hi, I'm Eric. I am a discovery services engineer with EBSCO. Um, <laughs> my talk is on the LTI protocol, and uh, I know that you guys have interacted with LTI before. Um, uh, in 2012, Dave Walker gave an LTI primer um, that described what the LTI protocol is, and in 2013, I noticed in the notes that Instructional Tools Breakout also discussed the LTI protocol, um, but I know most of you, like me, are first-timers, so briefly, LTI is a protocol that sends a bunch of data um, upon click over to a third-party website when a user clicks on an LTI link from a learning management system such as Blackboard, Moodle, uh, etc. Um, some of that information includes what the user's name was, the email address, what role they play, if they're a student or a faculty, that kind of information. So it allows us, libraries or library vendors, to create interesting tools that interact with students and faculty in uh, unique ways. So the problem that I wanted to address was adding library materials as required readings. It's a difficult process for faculty members because finding a permalink is something that not trivial if you don't do it every day. Um, statistics get thrown off if they decide to download a PDF full text document once and upload it into Blackboard because then you notch that as one full text use and you never know that 90 some odd students are reading it. And there are issues with copyright too. 
Um, the L EDS reading list tool is an LTI tool provider. So essentially, we build a tool that takes in, you know, who's coming into this tool. If they're a student, I mean, if they're a faculty member, we give them a search box that then searches the EDS API to bring back results, and underneath each result is an add to reading list button. When the faculty member clicks it, it stores that reading in a MySQL table that associates that reading with that list in that class. So when students come back, it displays that list of readings from that MySQL SQL table, and if they click on one of those items, it again queries the EDS API for a full text link and gets the students into the reading experience. Um, I'm actually going to try to do a live demo of this um, so you can see what it is. Um, it's a tool provider. It's written in PHP. It's my PHP MySQL application, so it's not entirely um, the most complicated of tools. Um, I saved my login stuff, so anybody who wants to get access to it can just steal this laptop. Um, I'm teaching several classes here. Um, I'm going to turn editing on. I'm, I'm ad logged in as a course instructor here into Moodle. Um, I'm going to add an activity or resource. External tool is the LTI tools in Moodle. In Blackboard, it's slightly different in the other learning management systems. I call this my week two reading list. This is the LTI tool. This is the bit that tells it where is this tool living, where should I send all of this LTI uh, payload to that creates a link here uh, that, when clicked, will launch into the reading list tool. Um, here's where I do a search for back pain, something like that. Um, you get back results from the EDS API. Uh, here's that giant add to reading list button. I'll add a few things to the reading list. Um, up at the top of the screen, you can do a few more things in addition just to adding. You can sort and annotate these things. Again, that's stored in the MySQL database, as well as adding uh, URLs and link labels there. And you can import from other existing lists in the MySQL system. Um, it's a multi-tenant application, so you can actually have multiple campuses tapping into one instance of this, uh, this tool. And then the copy list feature will actually only pull lists from that particular institution. Again, the student experience is meant to um, you know, get at what the student is trying to do. Um, so I'm going to switch my role here to student. Click on the week two reading list link. And the student is actually just presented with a list of readings to do. Um, here, the PDF link full text. Um, We'll actually let you straight through to the content without having to log in because we make an assumption that if you've authenticated to the learning management system, you are a legitimate library user. Now, if this content happened to be living on a different vendor uh, platform, that might be one of our custom links or an open URL link resolver, so you may end up being patched through your proxy server before being served up to the full text. Um, so that's what I wanted to show. Um, again, the power of the LTI protocol is, is you can do a ton of things with it. So I encourage you to go out there and try to figure out what else you can do with this really amazing protocol. And that is time, I think. All right. Thank you. Give me just a second to find mine. All right, so good morning. I'm Terry Brady from Georgetown University's library, and I'm excited to tell you about an application that I've actually worked on in two different jobs. I created this at the National Archives, found it really useful, and brought it to my current job. So um, imagine you've got a bunch of files on a file system, and you want to do something with those files. Perhaps you want to identify which files uh, pass a certain test criteria, or you want to extract information from each file and build a report or you want to convert each file you find to a new format. Well, in this application we call the file analyzer, we build what we call a file test rule, apply that against each of the files, and generate a report indicating what we did with each of those files. Similarly, imagine you've got a single file containing a bunch of records, and that file might be an XML file, a MARC file, an RSS feed, a CSV file, and you want to do something with every record you find in that file. Um, so you want to identify which records meet a certain criteria. You want to extract information from each of those records or generate new, a new file from each of the individual records. Well, in this application we call the file analyzer, you build what we call an import rule, apply that against each record that you find and generate a report. So, and then after you've run a couple different 
tests, you're able to compare and merge results and see, see if there are any differences. So this uh, file analyzer application I'm talking about, it's a, a kind of, kind of low-tech, we've talked about a lot of web applications. This is just a desktop application written in Java, and it's customized by writing new file test rules and new file import rules. And just to give you a, a quick view of what the application looks like, um, in this instance, you start out by saying, what's the directory you want to scan? What's the rule you want to perform against each of the files that you come across? The next thing is you indicate what types of files you want to work with. Uh, in this instance, you could pick all files, AV files, image files. Next, for some rules, you need to provide additional um, parameters, like if you're running a checksum, uh, you need to say which checksum algorithm you want to make use of. Then after you launch your results, uh, after you launch the task, the results come back in a table. You can sort the results, you can filter the results, and you can export the results for use in another application. So I want to talk about what have we done with this application. Well, we've done some really simple but really useful stuff, like um, counting files in a directory, matching source and target files either by file name or just base file name, uh, calculated checksums and uh, verified checksum integrity. Uh, we've done delimited file imports and exports and regular expression parsing. We've extended it a, a bit to do some more library specific tasks. So um, we've got some code to uh, validate four of the counter compliant reports. Um, our e-resources librarians found there were lots of errors in their reports and we were able to auto fix uh, certain things like um, dates in improper formats or certain, certain things falling in the wrong table cell of the reports. Uh, we've done a lot of, a few things for digitization related, like um, counting the number of pages in a PDF, extracting technical metadata from images, uh, creating Bagot bags and validating Bagot bags, uh, really just kind of providing a simple user interface to these tasks. And uh, we, we spent a lot of time in our DSpace instance, so we have the ability to um, inventory files for ingest, uh, create ingest folders and convert ProQuest ETDs into DSpace ingest folders. And at Georgetown then, we've taken some, this is some code we've not shared out, but we, um, we've used the same application as people have gotten comfortable with it to prepare um, ILS fine files for our bursar, uh, convert invoices to our university accounting system and export patron information to our consortium. So if you're interested, uh, we've got this code available on GitHub. It's pretty easy to uh, um, download and build. Um, I've got some wiki pages there that'll tell you how to use the application. Um, if you're interested, contact me. My um, address is there. And we've got a little gallery of some of the different applications that our library has shared out and made available for, available for other people to use. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Heather Rail, and I'm the Emerging Technology Librarian at um, Indiana State University in Terre Haute, Indiana. Um, you can find more notes about this presentation on my site, heatherrail.com, um, which I have here. So I want to apologize in advance for the ugliness of our website. It's hideous, and I know. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, this uh, charting JavaScript jQuery library. Um, called High Charts JS. So we've had people talking about uh, Google Charts API and D3. Um, I'd been on the job for about a month when my dean said, I want a dashboard. <clears throat> and she didn't know anything about them and I didn't really know anything about them. Um, so I went out and looked. And while I came across D3, I was like, oh my god, no. And uh, I found Google Charts and I didn't really like um, a lot of the default stuff and I didn't have a whole lot of time to delve into customizing things. And then I found this product called High Charts JS, um, which does a lot of the same thing as the Google Charts. Um, things that I like about it are you can turn on and off. Uh, um, sorry, you can't click on the pad, you have to use the buttons. Um, you can hover over and get more information. Um, and then one fancy little thing that I did down here 
is this is actually the only chart on the page that doesn't have just static data. I created um, using uh, Google Spreadsheets and um, uh, API call to um, our Google Analytics account to uh, chart hits per day. Um, and this is, um, I think, 180 days. Although something is a little odd. Ooh, I think it stopped working at the beginning of the year. You can see, uh, <laughs> I haven't looked at it in a while. Um, the cool thing about this chart is you can um, drag and zoom, if I can figure out how to drag. Um, you can get a little more detailed view, and theoretically, um, it's supposed to update every day. I have the uh, uh, code running once a day. It's not doing that anymore, I don't know why. Um, you can find kind of more how I did it if you go to my site um, presentations, and it's um, this one, the ACRL one. I talked about this in ACRL. So I used the um, Google Analytics Console in, um, in uh, the Google Developers um, site. I found a little script, um, and uh, there's this... Uh, thing in Google Spreadsheet where you can write scripts to run on the spreadsheet, and I'm sure you all knew that, but it was news to me. Um, and uh, I published the sheet as a CSV, um, and then in my, on my server, I process the CSV, pump it into high charts, and then I get this cool chart. So theoretically, one day, um, I will fix the um, issue with it not running in 2014. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I should have checked that last night. Um, uh, and that's kind of all I have. Thanks. Hi, Charts.js. It's very easy to use for those of you who are... I'm Ben Pennell from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I'm just going to be doing a brief little demo of a plugin that we developed for our digital repository. Um, it's used for basically uh, in-place metadata editing. It's not the only thing we have for that, but yeah. Uh, and yes, I will be showing some XML, so get ready to squint. Um, yeah, simply put, this thing is just a uh, browser-based XML editor, kind of a what you see is what you get thing. Uh, it's purely JavaScript, CSS. Um, its other main feature is that it, it actually pulls the structure out of schema documents and uses that to help guide you through constructing the document. And it has two major modes. It has the graphical editing mode and the text editing mode, which is actually just a thin layer on top of the Ajax Ace library. So now we get to hope the demo works. All righty. Um, so this is the graphical editing mode. Um, on the right is the contextual menu that I just mentioned, which is pulled from schemas. Uh, in this case, I'm dealing with mods, which is why there's such a ridiculously huge number of stuff, but yeah. Um, let's go ahead and add subtitle. Um, does attributes, things like that. Uh, has a couple other, like, UI-related uh, control methods that it takes, key commands, that kind of stuff, and also sports, like undo and redo. Yeah. Uh, so that's the graphical editing mode. Just pop over to the text editing mode. So like I said, this is just a modified version of Ajax Ace. Um, so the contextual menu still work here. Um, persists back over to here. Uh, in our digital repository, this thing is actually hooked up to a server and submits via Ajax, that kind of stuff, but right now this is just the standalone mode. So all it does is submits out to files. Um, yep. That's not my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so when I started working on this, I'll just briefly mention, there didn't seem to be any tools for using schemas in JavaScript, so we had to write an additional, uh, just basically an XXC to JSON converter. 
Uh, it doesn't cover the entirety of what you can put in a schema, but basically everything that's used in the schema or in the uh, XML editor right now, it works as either a command line tool or a uh, a uh, in-browser plugin. So you can pre-compile the JSON if you want to save every user from having to do that. Um, so yeah, we had to build those two parts, but it uses jQuery, jQuery UI, the Ace editor, um, quite a few. JavaScript XML APIs because every browser has its own, seemingly, or at least IE does, and some stuff for serialization. Uh, this slide is just my excuses for when people run into bugs, but basically, um, yeah, browsers are inconsistent about how they work with XML documents and particularly how they work with namespaces, so I had to kind of shoehorn that in there. Um, well, I haven't had a lot of time to work on this recently. Uh, we do periodically get requests from people on GitHub, so there are definitely some usability improvements that can be done, um, particularly for working with large documents. And along that same vein, uh, it would be good to clean up some of the spaghettiness of the code so that more people can actually commit back to it. We've only got a few pull requests so far. Um, but that's basically it. Um, people can feel free to try it out. It's on GitHub. Uh, the same demo I just showed you is there too. Uh, feedback, suggestions, code, anything? It's welcome. Thanks. Hello, I'm Liz Novak. And my name's Chris Figella. We're representing Massachusetts Maritime Academy. Um, we're a very special school, a state school in Massachusetts, where our students are all training to become um, working on either ships in the deck or the engine or working in international maritime trade. Uh, this picture is actually a 360 ship simulator that we have in our library on campus. Uh, a little bit unusual for most libraries, but we do have very common problems. Um, we, we are a campus that was very far away from a single sign-on, and um, we were looking for a way to streamline this, exper this experience, getting from uh, off-campus to um, our resources. And we had just drank the Google Kool-Aid, and we are a Gmail uh, campus. We use it for docs, email, et cetera. And we wanted to find a way to harness Google Open ID to um, authenticate for our off-campus users. Unfortunately, um, right now OCLC does not um, have Google Open ID as an option built in, so we were trying to find a way to still harness it and take advantage of it. Um, what we did find is that OCLC does uh, support authentication by a referring URL. So basically, if you, are, if you have the authority to see a certain page, then you have the authority to see um, your off-campus access, you, you are granted off-campus access. So what we did was we created a page that um, you needed to authenticate with Google Open ID, and then that page would take you to uh, whatever resource you are trying to get into to begin with. Um, this was really nice because if, if you're like me, I have my email open 24-7. Um, if you are already open, you're already logged into your Maritime Gmail account, you just brought right into that resource. So it was really um, streamlined for our, our users. Um, something that we found uh, after we launched this was that it was a little bit confusing for people that had their personal email open, their personal Gmail. So what we did was we added a little bit, uh, a little section here that asks, oh, would you like to be logged out of your personal email account and then log back into your Maritime Gmail account uh, so that you could then go straight into that resource from off campus. So what we did was we created a variable um, to remember, since you're essentially, you would be logging in twice at this point if you were asked to log in from your personal and then your, um, your Maritime email account. So we created a variable and um, we've been Having great results, our uh, users are very happy about having the streamlined service. If you have any questions for us, we're at library at maritime.edu. Super fast lightning talk. <laughs>
you sick of me hearing me talk yet? I did not realize that this it was this morning for lightning talks and what happened to Windows. Okay. Um, you can blame Dan Scott for me being up here again. Uh, <laughs> uh, he convinced me to do this talk. So the story goes that I was at LibTechConf last week. Um, there were a few guys standing around talking about or ended up in a discussion about how every person who works in a library seems to have a favorite search. Space law, Star Wars, Apple, psychology, you name it, um, you know, shooting lasers, whatever it is. So they thought, well, what if you had a page like thisismyjam.com, but then for favorite searches? So I got an invite at 7.30 in the evening after the entire conference was already over to go down to the hotel bar to help with this page. So all the credit goes to Matthew Raidsma for coding this. Um, but you know, he and I sat at the whole hotel bar until just about midnight. And there have been minor improvements since then, but we shipped this and put it up on github.com that night. So <laughs> uh, please go have fun with it. You put in your favorite search. Um, I did mention Star Wars, and that's mine um, when I'm not actually teaching a class. All you do is put it in. Um, it randomly pulls uh, a site using the URL uh, search query string, and then it just puts your search string in there. And it just does a random search from the kind of arbitrary list which we put in a PHP array. And if you share it on Twitter, it will keep the site that you are actually looking at by putting in the ID number as well. So you could theoretically, if you go hit the refresh button and try to hit share on Twitter every time, you could actually probably just, or you could just go on github.com and look at our list. <laughs> so to actually see the way. Um, we actually created a Twitter account as well so that you could submit new libraries if you don't see yours in there, which you probably don't because it's actually currently a very, very short list. But uh, again, it's, it's on GitHub. You can actually contribute it. You can see the code. It's just PHP and a, couple, and a single web page, really. But we just thought a lot of people would have fun with this. So go have fun. Thank you. All right, so two quick things before lunch. First, will there be a raffle after lunch? Yes. Yes, yes. so be back here by one. And then two, I forgot, a social event that announced, that's on the wiki for Wednesday evening starting around six. If those of you who are familiar with the podcast and video cast called Library Tech Cast, they are doing a recording of a show here. So go look at the wiki for more details. Otherwise, lunch is at the same place where we had yesterday and be back here by one. Thank you. <laughs>